I think going through this analysis is a little bit challenging, so I'm going to really try to break it down step by step. So the first thing is that we're going to look at all of these virtual sources that we've created with Hugin's principle, and we're going to look at them in pairs. And the pair is with a point that is A over 2 away. So we have this one and that one. Notice that in this case we've only dropped down six sources, so we have three pairs. If we then consider only one pair at a time, we then are in the same type of analysis that we did for double slit interference. However, we are, and this is important, we are identifying positions of destructive interference. On a later slide, I'll come back to why that is. But note that we're identifying destructive interference and we're looking at these two points. So we see, based on the same type of analysis that we did for single slit, that we have our angle there and we have our path length difference, delta r. So delta r for this pair will be destructive if this length is lambda over 2. So this is where it's slightly different from the two slit interference because we're looking at destructive. Now the other thing to know is right now I'm not plopping in an integer. I'm not talking about any patterns. There's an important reason for that. But we're going to really be looking for the first location, the first point where there's destructive interference. So that's why I can say lambda over 2 rather than like m plus 1 half lambda. So lambda over 2 thinking about one point. So then if every single pair also is destructive then the complete sum cancels. But notice that if I take for instance my pair here that is actually going to have the same triangle. I'm not very good at drawing it. And then our next one, this pair, also has the same triangle. So basically once you have destructive interference from one pair, that triangle is repeated for every single pair. So if one pair is perfectly destructive interference, every pair is completely destructive interference. And what that means is when you sum it up, you still get zero. Right? If every individual pair sums to zero, then when you sum everything up, you also get zero. So the complete sum cancels. And remember that when we talked about um, the diffraction grading, there was the subtlety that we were talking about perfect constructive interference there. Here we're talking about perfectly destructive. So in that case, we use our triangle to say that it's A over 2 is our spacing times sine of the angle to give us that path length difference. And we know, again, for one specific angle, so this is kind of the, the first dark spot, that A over 2 sine theta will give us lambda over 2, again, because it's destructive. So that's why you get lambda over 2. Notice that the magic of algebra means we then get to say a sine theta equals lambda. But what I want to point out about this is equation-wise, once you've simplified it, it looks very similar to the result for two-slit interference. But mathematically, we're coming to this result from a different approach, and we're actually saying that this is the location of the dark fringes. So this is a case where I think it's really valuable to understand the derivation because otherwise it's going to look like it's the exact same equation but it gives you the opposite results. Mathematically the source is different. It simplifies to look similar but since the source of the equation was different that's why it's okay that it's giving us really kind of a very different result. So what does this mean? We found our first dark fringe. We can then assume that there's more than one dark fringe, that is what we observed on our initial fringe pattern. So we can say that the second dark fringe is actually coming from pairs at A over 4. So this is the subtlety here. We are actually saying that we're going to keep pairing our points, but we need to have our, our pairs fill up the entire space of the, of the slit and be symmetric. So instead of pairing them at A over 2, we can pair them at A over 4. Then again, we want a path length difference of lambda over 2 to get our destructive interference. We have A over 4 sine theta equals lambda over 2. 
that then gives us a sine theta equals 2 lambda. Again, it looks just like our two slit interference bright fringes, but fundamentally our derivation is different. So notice that we index the dark spots for our single slit diffraction. We have this central maximum. And when I say diffraction here, thinking about the size of this central maximum is, is really important. That that in a, a big way is what diffraction is. But then these little side bumps, yeah, those are coming from, from interference. Um, so there's again kind of two effects to think about here. So we identify where the dark spots are and we index those um, starting at one and notice that we use the letter P here. Um, different books might use different notation but I do like using a different letter from M because the condition is actually different. The form that we're going to get here we have used the small angle approximation is that the theta that we get a dark fringe at so you can actually index this theta p is equal to p times lambda over a. The reason why it's helpful to not call this m is that m could start at 0 and p does not. p starts at 1. So again because we're finding the dark locations and we know that straightforward you expect that to be bright. So we have used the small angle approximation. Uh, typically this is over a small enough angular range that it is reasonable to use the small angle approximation. And notice that our integer p cannot start at zero. Um, and again, we're finding the dark spots. That's the most important thing to remember here and really challenging since that's different than what it's been for the other phenomena. So briefly, the book goes into this in more details and section five goes into it in great depth. The reason we can't identify constructive interference is because we're doing it pairwise. So what we've said here is that each pair is destructive interference. So this is what we're doing. We're saying, hey, that equals zero. This equals zero. I look at every single pair. This equals zero. At that point, when you sum it all together, it equals zero. So the reason that these look like they're arranged a little bit differently is that fundamentally we're looking at phase here and you can think about phase going through 0 to 2 pi so when we look at our pairs we've just been asking is the distance the same or not we're not asking how one pair compares to the previous pair so in our case we when we look at destructive interference we say every pair cancels we don't care how one pair compares to the next so these pairs have different phases, i.e. they're pointing at a different angle. Now let's look at this scenario. Let's say we were trying to find constructive interference. We see that these are constructive, right? They point in the same direction, which here means that basically your delta phi, right, equals zero. Here, let me call this first one delta phi one. Delta phi two also equals zero we have the same phase. So this isn't saying they sum to zero. Here they just sum to zero. Here our phase difference is zero. Here our phase difference is also zero. They're all constructive. But notice when we add them together, if you do the out the vector math or just kind of think through it, these cancel. The sum of all six vectors is zero. So this is why we can't use constructive interference. If all we're doing is identifying it pairwise, it's possible to have constructive interference between your pairs and still have your sum be zero because your pairs destructively interfere. So if we want to do a simple analysis, we can do the destructive pairwise version knowing that our sum is zero. Um, to do any sort of constructive analysis of single slit, we have to do a much more complicated analysis, which we are just going to skip. So lastly, the big important takeaway is we know what the position of the dark fringes are. We just use our trig to go from the theta equation to the y equation. So think about turning this on its side to really see that, or you could call this x. And again, remember that p is starting at 1. So this is the location of your dark fringes, right? So here, that's p equals 1. But now notice this is effectively, you know, your y equals 0 right in the middle. 
you also have a p over 1, a p equals 1 over there. So one of the things we commonly want to find is the width of this central maximum. And you can see that's just going from p equals 1 on one side of y equals 0 to the other. So all you have to do is plug in 1 and multiply by 2. So that's what this equation is for. So that just represents the width of the central maximum. And, and this is really about diffraction. So seeing all of those fringes after that, you can think about that as interference. But the point being that, that the term here on the bottom is your slit width. So as A decreases, as we make our slit more and more narrow, the width of the central maximum goes up. That is the key to diffraction. That as our slit becomes more and more narrow, the wave can spread out wider and wider. There is no ray phenomena that does that. Only wave phenomena do that. So, so that is really the, the heart of diffraction. Again, seeing all of these other light, light and dark fringes, yeah, you can think of that as interference. But this dependence, and right, L is just from geometry. So you can think of this as really that relationship between lambda divided by A, that once A gets smaller and smaller and smaller, your wave spreads more. So that's, that's the heart of diffraction.